Hello, I'm Hezin, and thank you for coming here. The topic I will talk about today is Hack DMI, Pwning HDMI for fun and profit. Yes. First of all, my name is Hezin, and I am a vulnerability assessment training mentee of BOB, which is the next generation cybersecurity reader training program in Korea. And his name, his name is Jung Eun-jin, and who is sitting down there? <laughs> and he's working as a researcher at a company named Theory, and he is a mentor at BOB. We are both members of the team Shinji Hajin, and actually I was a mentee and he was a mentor. We worked on the topic of vulnerability assessment for HDMI-based embedded device at BOB. Our team is made up of two mentors, one PL and five mentees. The table of contents is as follows. First, I'd like to give you a quick introduction about previous talk and one day vulnerabilities about HDMI. And after that, I'm going to talk about the CEC and DDC protocols that we regard as attack vectors. Finally, I'd like to introduce you to each protocol folder that we've made and tell you about the result. This is the previous talk about HDMI. Hacking display made interesting at Black Hat Europe and what the HEC at 44Con and high dive fuzzing at DEFCON. This is the one day of the HDMI, and it was the vulnerabilities of memory corruption type that occurred as CEC and DDC protocols. Now, let's talk about the HDMI protocols. Here, I will give you a brief description of the each protocol and the knowledge required to transmit the message or command that each protocol uses. If you listen to this part, you will probably be able to send the message to your device that supports HDMI. HDMI is provided for transmitting digital television, audiovisual signals from DVD players, set-top box, and other audiovisual source to the television sets and projectors or other video displays. Maybe even without this explanation, you've already used HDMI to connect your laptop to a TV or a beam projector. And also, I connected my laptop with HDMI today. And HDMI has four, four separate channels. It is TMDS, TDC, CEC, and HEAC. At first, looking at the TMDS part of the figure, you can see the video and the audio data on both the input and the output part. TMDS is used to carry audio and video data. The DDC channel is used by an HDMI source to determine the capabilities or characteristics of the sync by, the, by reading the EEDID data structure. HDMI sources are expected to read the sync EEDID and to deliver the audio and video formats that are supported by the sync. In addition, HDMI sync are expected to detect info frames and to process the received audio and video data appropriately. The next one is CEC. CEC channel is optionally used for a higher level user functions, such as automatic startup task or task associated with the infrared remote control uses. The last one is the HEAC, which is the optionally used as a high-speed bidirectional data channel and stands for HDMI Ethernet and audio return channel.
The four protocols mentioned above are mapped from the actual HDMI pins as follows. TMDS is from 1 to 12, which is marked yellow. And pin, 14, pin 13 is the CEC, and pin 14 is the utility line used by the HEAC. 15 and 16 are SCL, SDA, and 17, 18, and 19 are internal ground, VCC, and HPD. Here we were interested in functions such as carry controls, status, and data information, rather than the video data transmission. In addition, the protocol supports the both directions. So today we are going to talk about the CEC and DDC protocols. The first one is CEC. CEC stands for Consumer Electronics Control. You can connect your laptop or smartphone to your TV using HDMI. Of course, it's possible to connect multiple devices as shown in the picture if you have multiple HDMI cables. And you may want to control its devices. For example, you can adjust the volume of the home theater or change the TV channel. The CEC protocol allows you to control its, its, devi its devices with a single remote control. CEC is a protocol that provides high level control functions between all of the various audiovisual products in a user's environment. It provides a number of features designed to enhance the functionality of devices within an HDMI system. Because CEC provides functions in the user's environment, its manufacturer has a different brand name. So maybe AnyNet Plus or EasyLink, EasySync, rather than the CEC can be more familiar. And in HDMI, there are two types of the address, physical address and logical address. And the address used by the CEC message is the logical address. However, CEC is a protocol based on a bus system, so therefore cannot alone ascertain the physical connectivity of the network. So it uses the DGC protocol to allocate physical, physical addresses to devices in the network. All CEC devices therefore have both a physical and logical address, whereas non-CEC devices only has the physical address. The physical address is four digit long. It seems like the IPv4 address and it has a five device deep hierarchy. For example, the root device TV has 0000, zero, zero, zero and the connected device on TV have 1000 zero, 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 and 2000. Zero, zero, zero. In addition, the DVD and STV connected to the amplifier become 2100 zero, zero, and 2200. Zero, zero. When a physical address is allocated like this, then allocate a logical address. Logical address defines the device type. For example, TV is zero, a recording device is one, two, or nine, depending on the device type. Logical address is allocated through the polling message. First, take the first address and send a polling message. If it is a recording device, it sends a polling message to the first of one, two, and nine. Actually, it will be one. And if polling is acknowledged, it takes the next address. It will be two. And if not, it stops the procedure and retains that address. That is, its, it's logical address becomes one. The CEC message frame has this structure. The first is the start bit, which is followed by the header block and the data blocks. And 
It is a special bit indicating the start. The header block and the data blocks are each composed of 10 bits, which is consists of 8 bits of information bits and 2 bits of the control bits. And the data block is optional block. Information bits and control bits are described in detail in the next slide. First is the header block. The information bits in the header block contain the logical address. The addresses of the initiator and destination are each four bits. And the control bit has the same format for both the header block and the data blocks. The control bit includes the EOM bit and the ECK bit. The EOM bit stands for end of message. If the current block is followed by one or more blocks, it becomes zero. And if the current block is the last one, it becomes one. The ECK bit stands for technology, which contains the value of the technology of the data or head blocks. The data block also consists of information bits and control bits. The head block is essential, but the data block is an optional block. The data block has data block one and data block two, where data block one contains the OP code in the information bits and data block two contains the operand. The operand has a dependency on uh, OP code. If the OP code is 3.2, which corresponds to the set menu language, the operand will contain the language what you want to set. Data block one is one block, and data block two can be the multiple blocks depending on the OP code value. However, the maximum message size is 16 blocks. That is, the message with the maximum length is one block of header and one block of the data block one and 14 blocks of the data block two. The second protocol is DDC. DDC stands for display data channel and it is used by the HDMI source to read the sync EEDID in order to discover the sync configuration and capabilities. More easily illustrated, when you connect the TV and the laptop with the HDMI, the sync TV sends the EEDID data to the source laptop. So what data does DDC send? It's called EDID, Extended Display Identification Data. The EDID is a metadata format for display devices to describe their capabilities to a video source such as graphics card or setup box. This format is defined by a standard published by the VESA. However, EDID is for PC monitors. And EEDID is an extension of the EDID used to illustrate more advanced features. For example, PC monitors generally do not support audio, so a traditional EDID structure would not account for this, whereas an EEDID would. Therefore, it sends the EEDID data. The EEDID data consists of the EDID 1.3 and CA extension. And they have the following structures. Because data sent by the folder is also this EEDID data, so we need to know a little bit about the data structure. EDID 1.3 includes information such as horizontal size, vertical size, and color characteristics. And there is also an extension flag which means that extension data follows the EDID structure. And if you, if you are not sure what the EDID is yet, turn on your laptop. If your laptop is now connected to a TV or a monitor with HDMI, you can probably find EEDID data in your laptop. 
on Windows, it is stored in the registry. And on Ubuntu, it can be found in the path sys class DRM. And on Mac OS, you can check it through the IO registry. So HDMI transmits eEDID data over the I2C bus. As you know, I2C is a serial computer bus. And it is widely used for attaching lower speed peripheral ICs to processors and microcontrollers in short distance in trouble communication. I2C uses only two bidirectional open collector lines, SDA and SCL, pulled up with registers. Typical voltages used are 5 or 3.3, although systems with other voltages are permitted. We used Arduino to transmit the EEDID data directory. You can use other things, but you can easily use I2C slave mode with Arduino compared to the Raspberry Pi. You can connect the register and the wire to each pin as shown in the picture. The wires connected to the breadboard is in turn are SCL, SDA, ground, VCC, and HPD. And each line is connected to the pin that is mapped in the HDMI. With this connection, the hardware preparation is finished. So far, we have looked at the brief description of the CEC and the DDC protocols and each message. Now, I will use them to create a folder. The first is CEC. Any device that supports CEC can be the target device. For example, smart TV, beam projector, set-top box, Blu-ray, smartphone, and game controllers, and so on. In the case of a smartphone, it is highly likely to purchase an additional adapter. Make sure that the adapter also supports the CEC. And for CEC protocol, whether to support CEC rather than the type of the device is a more important factor to determining the target. For the CEC folder, all you need is a USB CEC adapter and a HDMI cable. We will use a Pi serial for serial communication. Now, it's time to send the CEC message directly to the device. There is a USB CEC adapter communication library, which is called libcc. It can be found in the GitHub. And if you have a USB CEC adapter created by Perse, you can send the CEC message. Of course, other adapters are also supported. And if you are having trouble to buying a new adapter, you can use Raspberry Pi. With libcc, you can send the CEC message as above. But this library is so well made that it can be drop our forging data. So we will not use this library when forging. Since the adapter shown above is the USB CEC adapter, data can be transferred via the serial communication. Of course, you can use Pi serial. You can send the message with just three lines of the code as above. This is a command to power off the setup box. Let's first look at the code that sends messages to the CEC adapter without using the libcc library. Before that, you've probably seen this picture. When data is transferred using the adapter, one block is represented by four bytes. More precisely, the information bits in a block. This works for both the header block and the data blocks. The four bytes consists, consists of message type, message code, message value, and message end. The actual data value contained in the information bit are stored in message value. 
message start and message and uh, the bytes representing the beginning and end of a block, respectively FF and FE. Message, can, message code can be thought of as a control bit. Here, the message to be transmitted has a structure of message start, message code, message value, and message end. At this point, you can see that the message code is different, which can be found in the libcc code in CEC adapter message code. For basic message transmission, you need to know about four message codes in your code. In particular, OB and OC are message codes related to message transmit. And I said that the message code is similar to the control bit. For the EUM bit of the control bit, that is represented by OB and OC. And the ACK bit is also similar. We create a folder for the three parts of the CC message frame. First is an OP code. For 3 6 was excluded because it is an OP code to power off the device. And the second is, one, is a operand. And we randomly selected a value from 0 to FF to transmit the operand of 14 blocks. And the header block is fixed to the logical address of the target device. In the case of an OP code, to increase the probability of a crash, we use the list of OP code that are likely to cause vulnerabilities. And finally, the message length. In the case of the CEC protocol, the maximum message size is fixed to 16 blocks. That is 160 bits. In addition, each block is recognized as a one block of header block and an OP code and operands in order. Therefore, data of various message sizes were transmitted, including messages that exceeded the maximum size. Now, it is a DDC protocol. The target device is an HDMI source device. Maybe you can probably guess the reason. Because the DDC protocol allows the sync device to send the EEDID data to the source device. Therefore, the source device, which is the device that received the data, was targeted. Source device includes desktops, laptops, set-top box, and smartphones. And we used the Arduino Mega 2560 and transmitted the data via the wire library provided by Arduino. Also, we called and soldered the HDMI cable for more reliable data transmission. If you cut the HDMI cable, you can get 19 pins and a wire connected to the each pin. And we connected the appropriate registers and wires to the required SCL, SDA, ground, VCC, and HPD locations, and solder them to make the same cable as the last picture, and then connect the, each of the five jumper wires to the Arduino. Now, we can transfer the actual data through the wire library supported by Arduino for communication with I2C devices. The main functions for data, data transfer are begin, only quest, only receive, read, and write. Note that it uses a 32 byte buffer, therefore, any communication should be within this limit. Exceeding bytes will be just dropped. But we will send the EDID value of 128 bytes. So I modified buffer length in the header file to 128 as follows. As a result, EDID data can be transmitted as shown in the picture. On the left is a code written using Arduino IDE. And on the right is the result of sending EDID data to the laptop via Arduino. 
And it is now stand the EEDID data. It consists of EDID 1.3 and CA extension. It's the CA A61D. At this time, if the value of the fluid such as header, padding, and checksum, which are marked in red or sideways, the fuzzing effect can be enhanced. We created the data in the above three ways when mutating. First, its structure of EDID, and second, random among the structures that are likely to cause vulnerabilities, and finally, a random value for all data. And one more thing to note here. To, to fall through the HDMI cable, the process of connecting and disconnecting HDMI should be repeated. However, if you have to plug in and out every time you send data, it's very inefficient and it will not be called a fuzzer. This is confirmed by the HPD signal. When the five ports is applied to the sync TV, the sync sends the HPD high to the source. And then the source sends an EDID request to the sync, and as a result, the sync sends the EDID to the source. So we repeatedly send low and high to HPD pin, giving the same effect as connecting and disconnecting HDMI. Now, let me tell you about the result we have obtained through our fuzzer. First, if you look at the CEC protocol, in the memcopy function, you can see a one byte st stack overflow resulting in a memory leak. In closer look, the top part of the right function is the CEC message value we sent. And we can see that the own transact function in libhdmi CEC contains the header and data blocks we sent. And the read int 32 and read C string functions are just that part. If you look at the own event update function in libhdmi CCJNI, copy it to VA using the value received above. At this time, a one byte overflow occurs. And the following is the DDC. And you can see that the kernel panics and fails to reboot when you send the EDID data. Also, we can see that the value is modified to 61 that we sent. In fact, we want more influential, data, influential results. But fuzzing with the real HDMI cable creates a problem of stability and speed. At the time, we thought that the graphics driver vulnerability is highly influential. So we made a graphics driver fuzzer of HDMI on Ubuntu. So I'd like to briefly introduce the Ubuntu DDC fuzzer that we, that we made. The process of creating this fuzzer can be summarized in four main steps. First, with source code auditing, I found the part that has HDMI EDID data. We confirmed that the EDID data is stored in the second parameter of the DRM to prove DDC EDID function, which is named buff, after calling this function. The second is hooking with K-proofs. The K-proofs is debugging mechanism for the Linux kernel. It enables you to dynamically hook into the kernel and allows you to do various actions through the callback function. The following source code is basic example. In ADDR thread of kproof struct, you can set the address of function to break. And you can set with the symbol using the symbol name and offset field instead of the ADDR thread. When the breakpoint, what you set in the address thread is hit, kproof code pre-handler, and after that instruction is executed, it calls the post-handler. And each handler's second parameter, which names Lex, 
it's pointing to the structure containing the registers saved when the breakpoint was hit. So you can counter the register value with it. Actually, we want to break when a function returns, so we use the return proofs. It's the other type of proofs and also called KLED proofs. And maybe K or SIMS could be helpful for you to get all connection proofs. And anyway, the code is similar to the K proofs. In the entry handler, we have saved the address of the buffer where the EDID data is stored. And before returning, that is after the EDID data is stored, we modified its value by accessing that address. In fact, we did not read or write the return value at RET handler, but instead changed the EDID value at the point of return. Now, we can mutate the EDID data. But there is one more problem to be solved here. That is, calling this function iteratively as if we had repeatedly sent HPD signal at the Arduino further part. I thought that using Xlender would solve this problem easily. Xlender is used to set the size, orientation, and reflection of the outputs for a screen. So we saw that EDID related functions would be triggered. However, when I used Xlender to create a folder, I got too much noise. So we did it another way, and we checked the core stack. There are various tools to trace the core stack, and we used F-Trace. F-Trace is an internal tracer designed to help out developers and designers of systems to find what is going in on inside the kernel. The files for using F-Trace are in the past sys kernel debug tracing, and there are several types of the tracers. Their types are defined in the file available tracers, and the traceable function list is in the file available filter functions. Trace results are stored in the file trace. First, we set the options to check the cross tag of DRM do proof DDC EDID as shown in the multiple echo comments. And this will give you the result shown in the picture. The result shows that this function is called from the IOCTL, and I checked the source code for DRM IOCTL mode get connector. Now, the final step is to call this one. And this is the libdrm or user space library for accessing the DRM on Linux that supports the IOCTL interface. And you can see the code for DRM mode get connected in this library. So we used it to call this function. As a result, we were able to complete the folder. The presentation so far can be summarized in these pictures of two protocols and the each protocol folders. And it is our future work. And source, are, source and images are as follows. Thank you for listening, listening so far. And if you have any questions, please send me an email. Thank you so much. <laughs>